Hi all, my name is Vishnu Dutt and in this video we will continue our discussion on SDXS control plane. In last video we discussed about how two hosts in a same network or VLAN communicate with each other in SDXS environment. In this video let's discuss how hosts that are part of different networks or VLAN communicate with each other. Once again we will use the same approach that uh, that is, uh, first we will understand how two host communicates when they are in same network in legacy environment and compare it with SDXS environment, right? To begin with, let's consider the below diagram. Left hand side, this one shows a network topology without SDXS. So let's start with this. First of all, these links between access switches and core switches are layer three links. This one this one this one all are layer 3 links okay we are running ospf routing protocol over all of these links all networks have been advertised into ospf switch one has switched virtual interface or svi configured this one with ip address 192.168.10.1 which will be the default gateway for vlan 10 right similarly we have svi configured on switch 3 with IP address 192.168.20.1 and this will be the default gateway for VLAN 20. Host A, this one, is part of VLAN 10 and host B here is part of VLAN 20. I believe we all are good with respect to this topology. Right guys, host A initiates a ping towards host B. So let's draw the ping packet here. Source IP address will be 192.168.10.10 and destination IP address will be 192.168.20.10. In Ethernet frame here, the source MAC address will be A colon A colon A, right? Can you guys guess what will be the destination MAC address here? So here is the change. Believe me guys, routing starts from host A itself. When host A initiates a ping packet, it checks whether the destination is in the same network or not. Host A can easily find out this information by comparing IP address of host B with its own IP address and subnet mask. If you don't agree with my previous statement, then we need to brush up some of our concept on IP subnetting. Or do write me in comment section if you guys need a video on IP subnetting. Okay, let's continue. If host A finds out that destination is not in the same network, it will send the ping packet to its default gateway. Or in other words, host A doesn't find host B in its local network. So it is taking help of default gateway to forward the packet, right? This is simple, right guys? So in our topology, host B is in different network, right? But still, we have the problem that we cannot complete this ping packet because we still do not have destination MAC address or MAC address of the default gateway. As we explained in pre previous videos also, host A will resolve the MAC address of default gateway by initiating an ARP request to the default gateway. Default gateway will reply with ARP reply and eventually host A will complete its ping packet. Correct? The important point to note here is that the destination MAC address will be the MAC address of default gateway and not the MAC address of host B. So in the ping packet, the Ethernet destination MAC address will be C colon C colon C. This ping packet will reach to access switch 1 SVI interface, right? As this ping packet destination MAC address is the MAC address of switch 1 SVI interface, switch 1 will remove the Ethernet header to get the inside IP packet. It will check the destination IP address of this IP packet and match it against its routing table. As OSPF is already running on these links, access switch 1 routing table must have OSPF route to reach 192.168.20.10 or host B. As we have equal cost path via this link and this link, depending on the hash algorithm, only one interface will be selected. Suppose this link is selected, the packet will be forwarded on this interface. 
Of course, while sending this IP ping packet, we need to complete the Ethernet frame using R, right? The source MAC address will be the MAC address of this interface and destination MAC address will be the MAC address of next hop or MAC address of this interface. Correct guys? So far, so good. Let's compare the same packet flow in SDX's VXLAN environment. For this, consider the diagram on the right hand side. Okay, we have some differences here in this topology. If we compare it with topology on the left hand side, here we have control plane node uh, and have configured a loopback interface along with SVI on axis switch 1 and axis switch 3. OSPF protocol is running on all these links as in left hand side topology and this time we are only advertising loopback interfaces in in the OSPF protocol. Okay. So all the switches in this topology know how to reach loopback interfaces of other switches. For example, switch one know how to reach loopback interface of switch three, right? Of course, Lisp protocol is running on access switch one and two and and also on three. Uh, so and and its control plane node is this one where it maintains reachability information about all the hosts so for simplicity let's assume control plane node has already filled its database with these values okay so we have these filled values right how control plane node fills these values is already explained in the last video okay guys so are you ready for the packet walk? Yep. As a first step, host A initiates a ping packet towards host B. All things remain same as we discussed on left hand side till the packet reaches a default gateway here, which means host A do an R for the default gateway. Default gateway replies with R message. Host A completes the ping packet and send it towards the default gateway right default gateway or switch one strips down the ethernet header and it will remains with the ip packet let's write the content of that ip packet here the source address will be 192.168.9.10 and destination address will be 192.168.20.10 right this is the moment where things get changed switch one looks into the routing table and couldn't find route for 192.168.20.10 host in OSPF routing table, right? Because in SDXs, we are advertising only loopbacks in OSPF. So switch one through list protocol will ask control plane node about the location of host B or 192.168.20.10 through map request message, right? Control plane node checks its database and reply that host B is reachable at location 10.0.0.2, which is the loopback address of switch 3. Here, this one, correct? Switch 1 will save this entry into its forwarding table. So now switch 1 knows that if needs if it needs to forward the IP packet. It needs to slap a VXLAN header and encapsulate it in another IP packet. Let's fill the content. So here, switch one will slap the VXLAN and UDP header and encapsulate it in another IP packet. You can easily guess that the source IP address of the outer IP packet will be 10.0.0.1 and destination IP address will be 10.0.0.2. Of course, route for 10.0.0.2 will be present in switch one uh, routing table as an OSPF route and it knows where to forward this packet. For this outer IP packet, everything beyond this point, this point will be its payload. So this final IP packet will be forwarded out, uh, out of one of these interfaces, these one depending on the equal cost multipath right and yes the ethernet header will be slapped on this ip packet before it could go out of these interfaces 
source MAC address will be the MAC address of this interface and destination MAC address will be the MAC address of this interface. Okay guys, this is simple. One more thing I need to explain here is that we are using OSPF on these L3 links as an underlay to forward our VXLAN encapsulated IP packet which you can say is our overlay or SD access fabric. Please have a look at my second video of this series to better understand SD access underlay and overlay. The important thing here is what we write in VXLAN header. Here, I would like to explain the concept of layer 3 VNI also. VNI, as you know, is virtual network identifier. So, whenever two hosts are in different network in SD access, we write layer 3 VNI value in VXLAN header, which tells the destination switch to forward the IP packet into correct VRF or virtual network. We will see in other videos that we can have multiple VRFs or virtual networks on these switches in SD access. So it is important to forward the IP packet into correct VRF. In SD access, this is achieved through layer 3 VNI. Okay. For example, suppose we have configured VRF A on switch 1 and switch 3 and SVI interfaces of VLAN 10 and VLAN 20 of these two switches are part of this VRF A. Okay, so here also suppose in switch 1 we map VRF A to VNI value 4500 and on switch 3 we have, have the same mapping which means VRF A is mapped to VNI value of 4500. So while creating VXLAN packet we write layer 3 VNI value as 4500. Okay. Here we write VNI value as 4500. When this VXLAN packet reaches at switch 3, switch 3 knows exactly what uh, the VRF corresponding to the 4500 VNI value, right? Hence, it will forward the frame into VRF A, correct? If last example doesn't make much sense to you, it is perfectly fine as I will be releasing video on VRFs or virtual networks in SD access. Okay, simple, right? In this video, we have seen how two hosts that are part of different network communicates with each other in SD access. I will also release videos on SDA border and fusion node soon. I hope you have enjoyed this video. See you soon.